late 17th and early 18th century are often referred to as the golden age of piracy. And one thing you would find aboard any given pirate ship was the ship's doctor. My name is Blood, Jefferson Blood, privateer and ship surgeon. And I shall be taking you through a short tour of what that might have meant for many a pirate. In the 17th and 18th century, you had various choices were you to become ill. The first, of course, was to die. But if you were seeking medical assistance, you had several options. If you were wealthy, you could go to a university-trained doctor. If you were less so, you might go to a barber surgeon. And if you were quite poor, you might go to a local herbalist. There were some differences between these different particular practitioners. For example, medicine was largely based on herbalism but university educated doctors frequently included new things metals for example here we have a rather interesting example of quicksilver mercury as you might know it this was a very useful treatment for a variety of illnesses or so we believe. Herbalists and university trained physicians largely used similar techniques and similar skill sets. However, the herbalist, much less expensive, and of course, focused predominantly on the local herbs and ingredients in his or her local area. Whereas a university physician might be using herbs from far further afield from across the ocean, and again, using things like heavy metals and other elements, as well as a smattering of superstition. A good treatment for many an illness might be to simply put a toad on one's chest. But of course, a barber surgeon, well, was first and foremost a barber. Beyond that, however, The barber surgeon was also the man who would amputate your arm or your leg, a finger or a toe, as the case warranted. However, as a ship surgeon, one had to be something of a jack of all trades, being able to produce both medicine and surgical procedures as warranted to treat ails and wounds. And on a pirate ship, this was extremely important. The chance of getting wounded was remarkably high. This was a violent lifestyle. Realistically, one could expect a slash, a stab, or a bullet. And of course, a cannonball could smash wood, throwing splinters and shrapnel, which could cause most serious wounds. And on top of all of this, there was still the possibility of disease. A number of diseases were more common, others less so. Some more accidental, some somewhat self-inflicted. For example, there was always the issue of scurvy. Not to mention a little problem with syphilis. And of course, play. Whatever the condition, it was up to the ship's surgeon to attend to the matter. There were no other options. There was only one doctor aboard a ship. And of course, that doctor had to deal with whatever issues, injuries, ailments, or whatsoever might possibly arise. We did this using a variety of different surgical and medicinals. We have the apothecary and the surgery. Amongst the medicinals we keep in the apothecary are such things as wormwood or cinchona bark, particularly good for treating malaria, oil of olives, laudanum, rather good for painkilling. We have cinnamon bark, cloves, 
jasmine flowers, and lavender. Oak moss, rose hips. Its syrup is especially good, I find, for treating the scurvy. Rose petals, used for making rose water. Excellent for cleaning wounds. Valerian, and of course, willow bark, are but a few of the ingredients we might have in our apothecary. Other ingredients, bay, bladderac, feverfew, lemon balm, mustard seed, nettle, pepper, sage, and Culpepper's favorite, tobacco, which was considered a very efficacious medicine, second only to the philosopher's stone. According to Culpepper, perhaps the foremost leading authority on herbalism of our age, of course, he'd used it to treat chronic lung conditions. Sadly, it didn't work quite as well as he'd hoped, and he died rather young from those conditions. Of course, medicines would have to be made, from potions to poultices, tinctures to salves. All would have to be produced from the ingredients contained within the apothecary. The salve is made by gently melting beeswax and oil and adding the herbals and mixing gently. Of course, at this stage, it looks thin and watery. However, at this point, we pour it into its cooling vessel. Finally, once the salt is cooled, it forms a paste. Very soft. Finally, we tie it up for use in future. But again, not all treatments were medicinal. Many were surgical. Uh, these were normally carried out with the patient wide awake and experiencing, potentially, rather a lot of pain. Of course, the surgeon had a wide array of tools available to him, depending on what was required. For example, in the case of a bullet wound, where an extraction was necessary, one might first need to open the wound somewhat. So, we have a variety of scalpels available to us, of course. But in order to actually open the wound, a retractor might be useful. Retractors could be large or smaller. So for example, were I to have an assistant, a pair of retractors could be used to pull the bullet wound open slightly to allow me to access into the wound. The problem is, of course, those sorts of retractors must be used with assistance. For example, here I have bullet forceps. Extremely useful for picking up a bullet because the rounded ends hold it very nicely. Now, of course, in order to use these forceps, I need to be able to have access. So the first thing I would wish to use would be a simple probe, allowing me to go into the wound and find the location and depth of the bullet. If I'm working on my own, I may choose to use forcep retractors, as these could go into the wound, and as I squeeze closed, the retractors open, opening the front of the wound. With the front of the wound open, I can then go in with the bullet forceps, grab hold of the bullet, and extract it. Of course, many injuries of the period were beyond the physician's ability to repair. 
thus amputation. It was the only way to save the patient's life. If you had a bullet that had smashed the bone or some other catastrophic damage that would require surgical techniques which did not yet exist, the only option was to amputate, be it a finger, an arm, a leg, or a toe. We had a number of instruments, for example, one of the more useful instruments when amputating something like a finger or a toe was a chisel with a curved end. This could be placed over the finger or toe where it was not wanted and then by hitting extremely hard with a good solid mallet we take it off in the blink of an eye. Bear in mind this procedure was done without any thought of painkiller so the faster you could work the better. However, in the case of an arm or a leg, that would require a slightly more manual approach, very hands-on. Of course, once you have cut the blood supply with a tourniquet, you would then move on to using a knife. An amputation knife typically was curved, with the sharp edge on the inside of the curve. That would be taken around to slice down to the bone. After which, a more conventional scalpel might be used to slice between the bones and separate all the flesh, veins, and arteries. Next in the procedure would be a leather thong, which would be wrapped around the patient's flesh on the portion we wish to save and pulled back and held by an assistant so as to expose the bone. At this point, we would go to the surgical saw. The saw was hand sharpened and would be used as rapidly as possible to cut through the bone. Not going rapidly would simply cause the patient too much pain. This was not a pleasant procedure at the best of times, so adding to the pain was the last thing we wanted. Patients could die of shock. Following the sawing, once the bone was sawn through, we would then proceed to use nippers or a file. Here we have that surface roughened to use to smooth down the bone and prevent any sharp edges which would cause the patient pain after the wound had healed. Throughout the Middle Ages and well into the 17th century, the cauterizer was used to seal the ends of the arteries at this point. This portion would be raised to red hot and touched to the tip of the artery, which would seal it very effectively. However, they did begin to phase that out and replace it with this instrument called a tenaculum. The hook on the end would be used to hook into the end of the artery drawing it out slightly, and a ligature tied on. This was found to traumatize the wound less, and patient recovery was greatly improved. Of course, other procedures were carried out as well. Uh, for example, gallstones could be removed surgically. This was an extremely painful operation. Rather famously, Samuel Pepys, the famous diarist, had this procedure done, where an incision was made using a scalpel, following which a curved probe was inserted into him, followed by duckbill forceps, which were then used to extract the stone. In his case, a rather large one, which they then, on the anniversary of the operation, took out every year and had a feast in its honor. 